gases and hot radioactive um, steam began to leak out and hydrogen. Now, in addition to the hydrogen that was created in the fuel, there was already a meltdown in process, and that fuel was now lying up against concrete. The concrete was liberating hydrogen as well. So we had two sources of hydrogen after the Daiichi accident. The fuel, as it created something called the Zerk water reaction, zirconium water reaction, but we also had the meltdown was causing more hydrogen because the hot fuel was in contact with concrete and that was liberating hydrogen as well. Now, the NRC assumes that containments leak at 1% a day. So in a, in a building this, in a room this size, what we're saying is that the, the gases that are released um, would, um, would be about 1%, meaning over 100 days, the gases in this room would leave and fresh gases would come in behind it. But what the NRC said in a phone call um, on, um, uh, on March 23rd, is that the reactors at Daiichi were leaking at 300% per day. That means that the gases inside Daiichi were leaving the containment every eight hours. Whatever radiation was getting out of that nuclear fuel was being liberated to the environment within eight hours because the containment leak rate was 300% per day, not 1% like the NRC assumes. Assumption number three is noble gases. Now, if you remember your high school chemistry, raise your hands if you do. I don't see many hands. Oh, I do. <laughs> the far right of the periodic table is the, uh, are noble gases, things like xenon and krypton. They're called noble because they don't react with anything. Nuclear fuel is loaded with noble gases, and as long as the fuel retains its integrity, the gases are trapped inside. Well, the fuel didn't retain its integrity, and all the noble gases were released. Um, the data indicates that uh, over Chiba, the xenon, which is a noble gas concentration, was 400,000 times normal uh, immediately after the accident. And also that the concentration of xenon in Chiba was 1,300 becquerels per cubic meter for eight days. Now, a cubic meter is about three feet by three feet by three feet. And think about it, inside every cubic meter of air over Chiba, there were 1,300 disintegrations emitting radioactivity every second for eight days. What were those people breathing? Gases with no, noble gases, which can't be monitored now. They're gone. So I think one of the issues here is that the, uh, the Japanese government has no idea how, uh, how much exposure the people in Chiba got from this cloud of, um, of noble gases that were released. Um, this is important data that just came out. Um, Mainichi um, covered this story, but it's actually Fukushima Prefecture data, and it's only a couple of, uh, of days old. Um, there were four radiation detectors that continued to work after the Daiichi accident. Almost all of them didn't have power, but a couple were battery powered, and they just recently discovered the data. Um, normal background on these radiation detectors was about 0.04 microsieverts. Um, at five o'clock in the morning, right after the accident, the, back, it, the radiation in the detectors was 10 times background. Six o'clock, 60 times background. Nine o'clock, 150 times background. 10 o'clock, 700 times background. What that means is that somebody in the, uh, in the vicinity of these uh, uh, radiation detectors was getting a yearly dose in 12 hours. Then the vents were open. So this is a clear indication that the containments were leaking well before the vents were open. So at, um, at three o'clock, these same detectors were measuring 30,000 times background. That means a yearly dose in 10 minutes for the people in, in Chiba. Now, it's also important to realize this may not be the worst. This happens to be where the detector was, but it doesn't mean that the plume chose to go to the detector and get that, um, and get that reading. Uh, this is a complicated slide, but it shows exactly what I did uh, talk about here geographically. The um, uh, one detector was here. Well, here's the plant. One detector was here, here's its spike. Another detector was here, here's its spike. 
Another detector is here. Here's its spike. So it geographically ties this data around. So it's clear that this plume was me meandering all over uh, the western side of the plant and the northern side of the plant, even before the vents were open. Uh, also, one of the detectors um, continued to operate, and here's the spikes in the detector. There's no correlation between these spikes and when the venting occurred and when the, um, um, and when the explosions occurred. There's no correlation, which means that other phenomena had to be happening as well that scientists have not yet evaluated. Assumption number four. Uh, the decontamination factor for cesium, and I'm sorry, this is a little bit geeky, but um, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission assumes that after a nuclear accident, the water inside the torus, which is the donut at the bottom of the containment, takes out 99% of the cesium. That's called a decontamination factor of 100. That's actually written into law that they, they believe that to occur. But they also say that if the water hits boiling, there's no decontamination factor. The water is incapable of, of uh, capturing any cesium. Well, the data from Fukushima shows that the water in that, in that torus, at the bottom of the containment, did boil. Why did it boil? Because those cooling pumps I was telling you about that cool the diesel were also designed to cool the torus. So we had boiling water in the torus, and that meant that no cesium was retained. Now, the Japanese, as they're trying to reconstruct this accident, are claiming cesium was captured inside that torus, but the law and the data show that it couldn't be. There was no cesium deposition, or no cesium retention inside the suppression pool. Now, how do I know that? This is an important slide. Um, it's uh, kind of blurry. It's an infrared image of Unit 3. The, um, the large blotch in the center of the scene, screen is the spent fuel pool on Unit 3. That's here. And the, the temperature of the gases coming off the spent fuel pool are 62 degrees centigrade, which means that the fuel is boiling and it's mixing with cold air, and there's a bath of hot radioactive air over the fuel pool at 62 degrees. That's pretty bad. But what's worse is the flare that the drawing shows. Now, TEPCO's known about this for two years and has not talked about it. Nope, sorry. That flare right here is exactly where the containment should be. And that flare is at 128 degrees Celsius, which means it's not steam. Steam can't exist over 100 degrees. Engineers call it something in the steam tables, but at atmospheric pressure like we are today, when you boil steam, you're only going to get to 100 degrees centigrade. That flare is at 128 degrees, which means that it's not steam. It means it's hot radioactive gases being released directly from the containment. It also means that inside the containment, it was not below the boiling point of, of water. It was above the boiling point of water. There was no liquid water inside that containment. This is on March 20th, nine days after the accident. The containment is venting hot radioactive gases directly to the environment. This is proof positive in my view. Uh, and, and TEPCO, obviously, they're good engineers, and they would have seen that 128 degrees centigrade, about 250 degree hot radioactive flare being released in this infrared picture. So they've known for a long time that huge amounts of cesium were being released directly to the air because they weren't being trapped in the water in the suppression pool. The last assumption is hot particles. Um, uh, this is uh, um, me and, and Reiko, my uh, co-author of the book we wrote in Japanese, uh, taking a sample when I was in Japan in February of last year. Um, the, um, the soil, I took five samples in five days. Uh, I just went to a piece of, of, of pavement or a piece of, uh, in one case it was a, a children's um, uh, park right next to a uh, school. The kids were playing right next to me, throwing stones like kids do. I took a bag of samples and I brought the five samples back, declared them through customs and, and they were analyzed by Marco Kalthofen at Worcester Polytech. And um, each of the samples 
exceeded 7,000 becquerels per kilogram. What that means is in a two pound box of sample, uh, we were getting 7,000 disintegrations per second of cesium in Tokyo, more than 100 miles away from the accident. Think about that, that's like you know, New York City, Tokyo and New York City, roughly comparable as far as the, the importance to their nation. And 7,000 7, becquerels per kilogram qualifies as radioactive waste in the United States. So the people in Tokyo are walking around with spots that have radioactive waste. And I didn't go hunting for this stuff. It was, it was right on the side of the sidewalk. Uh, this is an auto radiograph of a car filter in um, uh, taken. What that means is we had people, uh, uh, Fairwinds had people send us air filters. And uh, one box arrived, totally unexpected. And I, as I approached it with my Geiger counter, the Geiger counter started to go off at, um, uh, at, at five feet away. It was a car air filter. We took the car air filters and laid them out on an x-ray plate. Uh, Marco Kaltofen did at Worcester Poly. And these are the burn marks in the x-ray plate after the x-ray plate was set in a safe for several days. Uh, Fukushima Daiichi's on the right, Tokyo's in the middle. Uh, those show hot radioactive particles trapped in the air filter. Well, people were in those cars. Kids were in those cars. If it's in their lungs, if it's in their air filter, it's in their lungs. I think it's safe to assume that the people in Fukushima City and the people in Tokyo had enormous exposure of hot particles directly into their lungs. We also asked for kids' shoes. Uh, this is the concentration of cesium on children's shoes. Kids tie their shoes. Kids eat with their hands. That's in their stomach, it's in their gut, it's in their intestines. Um, I thought I'd compare what's a, what the available inventory of radiation was for cesium um, compared to, uh, to Fukushima Daiichi. Now these things are called uh, uh, petabecquerels or petabecquerels, and it's a whole bunch of zeros on the end of a number. Um, the, um, the total available cesium at, uh, at Chernobyl was 2.9 with 17 zeros behind it of cesium. There was almost three times more cesium available to be released at Daiichi 1, 2, and 3. We know for a fact that, uh, that 300 percent, three times more noble gases were released from Daiichi. There can be no argument about that. Now people are wondering how much cesium was released. Chernobyl shows that about a third of the cesium was released from Chernobyl and um, Japanese experts are saying that, oh no, it can only be about 1% of the cesium was released or maybe 2% of the cesium was released from Fukushima. I don't believe that's true. And I don't believe that's true because of the drawing I showed you before, where the temperature inside that reactor was on the order of, uh, inside the containment, was uh, so hot that there was no liquid water to retain the cesium. The Japanese experts believe that the cesium was retained in the water but that infrared photo that I showed you earlier clearly shows that couldn't have happened. So I conclude that the noble gases were three times the, um, the, uh, the releases of Chernobyl and um, the containment leak rate was 300% per day. That's an NRC number. And that the decontamination for, for cesium was zero. Nothing was getting filtered out, scrubbed out in the suppression pool. Um, the one good thing that Fukushima had that, that, that um, uh, Chernobyl didn't is that one side was water and a lot of times the wind was blowing out to sea. But offsetting that was the last piece on the page, which is that the population density in Japan is a heck of a lot worse than the population de uh, in, um, it, it, around the Chernobyl reactor. And finally is the liquid releases. I really haven't had time to even talk about them, but they'll continue for years and years into the future. And we already know that the liquid releases are 10 times Chernobyl. The Tokyo has 35 million people in metropolitan Tokyo. And Prime Minister Khan said, our existence as a sovereign nation was at stake. Now I already know, I've taken the five samples that show the portions of Tokyo, all over Tokyo, were as radioactive as what we would have to send to a radioactive dump here in the United States. So I think the, the, the point is, at what point do the risks of a technology 
become unacceptable. Well, my conclusion is that sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proof.